Hello, welcome to the University of Wisconsin Parkside. My name is Sophie Lapochek. Today we are presenting to you a recorded interview featuring Dr. Luis Frederick Aldama, otherwise known as Professor Latin X. This interview was conducted by Catherine Brooks and myself. Unfortunately, we had some audio technical difficulties during the live stream to YouTube within the first five minutes of recording. Throughout the remainder of the recording, you will be able to enjoy a clean audio. We sincerely apologize for this inconvenience and we hope that you stay with us until the end of the recording. Thank you. Hi, we're here from the University of Wisconsin Parkside in Tomosa, Wisconsin with Dr. Frederick Lee Saldama from the University of Texas Austin. I'm Catherine Brooks. And I'm Sophie Lacosa. And we're students of the Science Department. So, Dr. Aldama, um, our first question to dive in is, what inspired you to write, and what continues to inspire you to create? Mm. Ooh, what inspired me to write? Um, oh, gosh. Yeah, that's a really good question, because, I, you know, when I was back in college, um, like the two of you, um, I, my first kind of step into college was actually into the sciences, mostly because that's what, in our community, it was like doctors and, you know, folks like that that had kind of prestige in the community, the ones that our family talked about. Um, and so, yeah, I was like doing sciences. And, and I was at Berkeley in huge classes, like over a thousand in like OCHEM. I mean, really, like huge classes. And after a semester, actually two semesters, I realized there was no way. And part of the reason, or one of the reasons why I was, said no way is that uh, a couple of days a week, early in the morning, like Tuesdays and Thursdays, nine, a 9 a.m. class, I had this really cool, there were about eight or nine of us. It was a um, morning class seminar, and it was world literature, comparative literature. And, um, yeah, that just like literature and plus the person that was teaching it. I'm like, how, how can I become that person, mm -hmm. right, yeah. Catherine? Yeah. I know that's your um, goal as well. And so, because you were doing, you were, you were teaching. My mom was a bilingual education teacher. Kind of did, you know, really committed herself to that. So, yeah, teaching just seemed like it seemed like I was misdirected. Um, and then finally found my path. And literature and writing for that class became my joy, my passion, and um, and also the ways that we could also, you know, generate knowledge and creation in, the, in those spaces. Um, I'll just say really quickly that, um, you know, like many of us when we're kids, we write stories. I think all kids, you know, either draw or write um, stories. And one of the stories that I um, imagined and then wrote was about Chupacabra Charlie. And so finally now, you know, um, what, 2017, 2018, my Adventures of Chupacabra Charlie kids book came out. So it took that long, mm -hmm. but that story actually its origin started when I was little. So maybe there's something um, kind of about that as well. So, but great question. <laughs> Very awesome, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like Chupacabra Charlie. Um, a lot of that was inspired by my grandmother telling us stories about when we had, we lived in a rural part of Northern California. And whenever our chickens were basically eaten, um, it was the chupacabra. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and for those of, you know, of our listeners and viewers that don't know, the chupacabra is like, well, actually, it's, there's a chupacabra right now on Netflix. It's yeah. in this show called The Imperfect. And Juan turns into a chupacabra, but the chupacabra is, you know, this kind of fangy little monster um, 
that it's basically literally kind of like goat sucker um, and ne not a nice looking monster, kind of, you know, hairless, spiny um, back, all that stuff. Um, and my chupacabra was actually like a friendly chupacabra, um, but it was inspired by these stories that my grandmother would tell me. And he was friendly because he wasn't like the other ones. Um, and he didn't like to eat chicken. He was a vegetarian. Okay. And so, yeah, so kind of putting that aside for many, many years um, until, well, actually was reading about and hearing about um, some friends and um, those in our community about the experiences of people um, really putting very difficult situations in Mexico and Central America to cross the border into the U.S. And in the last presidential administration, um, there was a policy where the children were s separated from the mm -hmm. um, parents or parent and even separated from one another as siblings because of the gender segregation within the, the what are called like mm -hmm. the ice cages. And I, so I'm like, hold on, this is a really, this is terrifying yeah. um, and it shouldn't be happening. I'm going to go back into like the re deep kind of repositories of my, um, you know, memory and my um, storytelling and bring to life Chupacabra Charlie. And so he and Lupe, his human friend, um, that's their adventure. They go mm -hmm. um, and they figure out how to cross the wall from Mexico into the United States to save the kids from the cages. Wow. Um, but yeah, so, but there are so many amazing characters as you both know, um, you know, being, you know, both of you studying Spanish and reading um, fiction and literature and being so excited and interested in culture. Um, we find our heroes everywhere, right? And uh, sadly, unfortunately, and one of the reasons why, um, you know, I've, I've written books like Real Latinexes, so this kind of scholarly books, mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, for Latino, Latinx, Latine um, communities, we, even though we're the majority historically underrepresented in this country, we're still very, um, so we are around 19% of the population and yet we're less than 3% represented. Mm -hmm. And we can say that about all of the different um, groups that make up the United States. The, there's this kind of st this tight hold on what the United States looks like and it's not reflecting actually how the United States looks. So when you ask heroes and characters that are really significant and important, you know, it's every time we see like a Latino, you know, character um, superhero that's done well, mm -hmm. they become our heroes. Um, and I can say the same for our Asian American and um, black and indigenous communities. Um, same thing, right? Hungry, 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 because we're starved, starved, starved. Yes. Yes, that was, I totally relate to everything, definitely. Um, I'm super into pop culture and I'm always reading on Twitter and things like that. So we know Disney is releasing a live action Little Mermaid movie mm. and there is some controversy around the casting. So I was just wondering your opinion on uh, live action projects like this. Yeah, you know, um, so there's, when I mentioned that um, mainstream popular culture in the United States is out of step with actually what the, the, the composition of the United States is today and, and has been historically. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever we seem to kind of gain some ground in that area where we're finally getting writers of color in the writing rooms, we're getting, um, you know, uh, actors, actresses of color in front of the camera, behind the camera, directors, et cetera, shaping the stories and bringing in those experiences and those identities into those story making processes, um, there's a pushback and there's a reaction. And some of it's very extreme and very toxic and sometimes even threatening mm -hmm. death, right? Um, to those who are really um, visible in those spaces. So, you know, Comics Gate, um, you know, the, all of the stuff that came 
first in the kind of video game spaces, women, you know, playing video games, like everybody jumping up and down, what's going on? Um, MCU casting, right? You know, yes. we get, you know, we finally get some diversity within the MCU. Disney, um, you know, the Star Wars franchise. So anytime that we get a little bit of kind of space within this um, very controlled um, imaginary that has disallowed our presence, there's always going to be pushback and reaction. And unfortunately, it's very, it can be very toxic. I can say this though, um, usually the more of a reaction and the more toxic it is, as bad as that is, it usually reveals, and this goes to your psychology degree, um, it reveals something going on where those who have traditionally been in positions of power or gatekeeping the stories that are told are no longer feeling like they are in control. Mm -hmm. So the stronger you see the response usually reflects the weaker the hold they have actually on right yeah. controlling what we finally see yeah. and i think we're in that moment right yep. now i totally totally agree and it was really you know jolting to see that but just like you said i never thought to look at it like that but yeah we're making noise and they don't like it so i i really love what you just said for sure um and then on um, a, a different note i know you were talking about um a few things that connected with me from your book Latinx um, and also Kat, we have some examples from your book that we'd like to bring up. Mm. Um, both of us grew up watching Ugly Betty as mm. well as um, mm -hmm. Jane the Virgin, that mm -hmm. was the only one. Mm -hmm. um, and we agreed with pretty much everything that you said in the book. Um, there are a few mm. points which I would like to bring up. Mm -hmm. So. Um, for um, something that I really recognize with, since they are comic, um, like a satire form of show, um, I noticed mm -hmm. that um, the comedy wasn't um, like a generalized stereotype mm. that people were overusing and um, just using to um, to generalize a whole group of people mm. um, but I think that might be part of what you said that both of these shows were originally written um, in Latin America and they had producers mm -hmm. um, they had people in front of and behind the camera who um, were mm -hmm. Latinx and who identified in this in this way I know Kat has Mm -hmm. a few more things to say yeah. about everybody than I do, <laughs> mm -hmm. but those were a few of the shows that we really identified mm -hmm. with and that we um, enjoyed watching when we were... Yeah, yeah. so um, it's, I'm glad you brought up Ugly Betty um, and <laughs> Jane the Virgin. Um, so I think I was a little hard on Ugly Betty, maybe, right? I, I, was I? Maybe. Because um, I, I think I call it a Cinderella story. Yeah, I was going to bring um, that up. <laughs> and then, right, the, like, you know, the whole, like, it ends with her not exactly kissing the guy under what Nelson's column there, you know, in London, but um, the white guy that is. Um, but I mean, yeah, she gets the, the white boss, the owner, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have since become a little more um, generous with the show. And let me explain why. Um, maybe it's because I love America Ferreira and I finally got to interview her and um, that was a really important show for her mm. and you know talking to her about it and you know it was she was at USC at the time trying and she got the call for Ugly Betty she was still trying to juggle like her you know launch of her film her media sort of you know you know, what became like this incredible career with going to college. And she finally, you know, put college, had to put college on hold to do Ugly Betty um, for, you know, all of those seasons. Yeah. And, um, you know, 
it, it put her in a place, you know, materially where she today can produce shows like Hintified, direct, um, you know, important, you know, other shows. Um, I am not your Mexican daughter, um, I, and you know others that she's doing working on, and she did Superstore, which like I I love Superstore. Me too. You know, yeah. yeah. It's so smart, right? Yep. Um, and the so I still think the Ugly Betty, you know, suffers from that kind of the brown girl kind of attaining success finally in and through the sort of white guy, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, but I think if we look on the other side of it, it was a really important place for America Ferreira and it's gotten to her to places where now she can make a difference and open doors for others. Mm -hmm. um, so Jane the Virgin, I love, right? And I can't remember exactly what I said, but I do know that what I, one of the things that I love about Jane the Virgin is that we're never asked as an audience like the ideal audience of that show is you know latinos um whereas ugly betty the u.s ugly betty the kind of the audience that the producers were making this for were not necessarily latino even though the family is a kind of composite latino family and justin coming out was really significant mm -hmm. for a lot of us um but um, it felt like that was still being made for a mainstream audience, a general audience. Yeah. And Jane the Virgin was being made for a very kind of specific audience. And then it appealed to a, a bigger, larger audience. And I think that's a significant move that we start to see in um, writing and in producing and filming and casting for television. Right, so this idea that now actually Latinos can be our main audience, and then others can are welcome, mm -hmm. but we're gonna make the show for Latinos. Yes, yeah. Um, now that you say that, totally, um, it was kind of like a cool, uh, like their own thing. It could be their own thing. Jane the Virgin and Ugly Betty was more for. It was more broad, like you were saying, mm -hmm. and I know you said the U.S. Ugly Betty, but when I was doing research on the show, I didn't. It started in Colombia, and I had no idea. And all these countries started doing their version of Ugly Betty. So I just thought mm -hmm. that was really cool to see a little telenovela really grow to be how big it got. Yeah. And when you were saying in the book about Cinderella, about how a lot of Latinx people have to leave their family to pursue their success that they want. And I see that paralleled in a lot of minority groups. So I just thought that was interesting, um, having to leave your loved ones. And if it's moving away or, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's the, I mean, it's the assimilation story, mm -hmm. right? So to make it in this country, there's a sense that you have to leave your roots, your culture, your identity behind. And that identity that, you know, to make it in this country, there's this, this sense, this idea that, um, um, yeah, that that's, you know, that's the aspirational assimilationist narrative that a lot of um, stories, pop cultural stories tell us constantly, no matter what group we're in. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to somehow to be recognized and to have made it, you have to leave, you know, your family, your community, your culture behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those were a few of our favorites, and now we want to turn the tables a little bit and ask you if there are any movies out there, any shows that you would really recommend that we should be watching. Oh boy, yes. So <laughs> I just mentioned The Imperfects, uh, Los Imperfectos, okay. which just, you know, is on Netflix right now. And I think it's like a 10 episode run. Okay. I think it just got renewed. Um, and Oh my God, you guys, if you haven't seen it, you, you'll okay. like, make sure you have a whole weekend free because okay. you will like want to watch it from the beginning to the end. Um, but there are these really, you know, uh, going back to the writers and um, smart writing, um, creating really interesting characters, um, complex, relatable. Um, they've all been experimented on these three protagonists. One of them is Juan, and he's a comic book creator, which is really awesome. Yeah. 
and an aspiring kind of, you know, comic book creator, but he's, you know, publishing these really cool comics. And his, after his mutation takes place through this experiment, um, he, when he gets angry, he turns into a chupacabra. And um, he learns to kind of control it, and the chupacabra comes out, or chupi, as mm -hmm. his girlfriend calls him, uh, when he's the chupacabra, uh, to protect his loved ones, right? So, yeah, I just love that we have we have written into what is basically a kind of a, 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 a new mutant kind of X-Men, you know, yeah. story. Um, diversity, there is, you know, Abby and Tilda as well, and Abby is South, um, South Asian American, um, and Tilda's white American, but a kind of, you know, alternative, you know, she's like, a rocker for a band and stuff like that, and they all have their superpowers. But I love that they brought, they were thought to brought in, bring in our, the stories that we hear in, the, in many communities in Puerto Rico and in, in Central America, in the Southwest, like the Chupacabra, mm -hmm. right? And so writing that into this space um, in a really natural way, I think is really a remarkable moment in television, right? In yeah. platform streaming TV. But there's so many other shows, like Hintified, I think, is a really great show. I love the reboot of Party of Five, which is all Latino. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, you know, in the original Party of Five, which was kind of my generation, um, the parents, I believe, were killed in a car crash. And here, the parents are deported because they don't have documents. So it, you know, already right there are some really interesting tensions and um, ways that the story kind of wakes us to everyday realities that are, you know, our community faces, mm -hmm. where you have these mixed status families that are basically, you know, forced back across the border or weren't able to cross the border while some are here, some are there, and what that means in terms of still trying to hold family together. Um, but gosh, yeah, I mean, one day at a time, um, and then, of course, a bunch of the superhero stuff. Like, I am a big fan of, you know, the Miles Morales into the yes. Spider-Verse. Yes. And I just, you know, the first time I saw that, I was in Columbus. And it was one of those where it was a kind of free ticket day, the launch of the, um, of, of the Into the Spider-Verse. So it was all these black and brown families that were packed, had packed out the, the big cinema in Columbus. And it was like it brought so much joy to everybody and the kids and the kids playing and like mm. you know up on the up at the front of the screen you know already being like miles and yeah. um i think that you know that was a remarkable kind of milestone for us as well coco yeah. um the book of life yeah. all of these right um so yeah, there's, we are, it's, you know, I talk about it in my latest book on Latinx TV, but I think we've moved from moments where we were like, oh my God, you know, we have like a Latino, one Latino um, this year in TV mm. to what I call a movement, um, a more, a steadier stream, yeah. you know, which allows us to see more, a, a greater range of representation. Yeah, I love the, the moment versus the movement. I really love that. Um, there were two projects released this summer on HBO Max that I enjoyed, but I'm curious to hear what you think. So the first is the Gordita Chronicles. Mm. Um, so yeah, there was, I, there was a mix of yeah. reviews about that show. So I was just curious. Okay, so um, I know I'm supposed to be Professor Latinx and have watched all <laughs> of the stuff that comes out. It came and went like it, so fast that I didn't get a chance um, to even like for two seconds take mm -hmm. a look at it. But I think that Catherine that, you know, speaks to you know, the kind of thing that right now we can constantly face. So even though it may feel like we're in a movement, we still have to fight and support because um, comics are released with Latino superheroes and if they don't hit a certain marker, which is usually a higher mark than other comics that are, you know, mm. white co superhero comics 
um, then they get canceled. Or someone like writes, you know, a critique and suddenly like Marvel or DC decides they're going to cancel it. Um, and La, La Gordita Chronicles, I know I haven't seen the show, so I can't speak to like production quality, writing and so on. But I can say that it wasn't given a chance. Mm. Um, and this is pretty typical. Even shows that were really successful that I love, like Hintified, um, Vida, mm. which is another really great show. Uh, really smart writing. You know, I, from what I can tell, you know, queer and brown, like pretty much from like writing through production, through everything. And it got, you know, two seasons and it disappeared. Um, so... That is, in fact, America Ferrer talks about this when I interviewed her, but that is the struggle, and it continues to be a struggle. Even though we're hitting the marks, the demographics are there, it's our families that are going to the movies, it's our families that are taking our bigger families to the movies mm -hmm. and making box office you know, hits, and yet you know, there's still um, this very quick w way that producers react um, you know, and then pull and cancel. Yeah. Um, and what was the other show? Um, so the other project was the remake of Father of the Bride oh, with gosh. the Cuban family, um, okay. with Gloria Estefan. Well, what did you think of, did you see it? I did, I and did see what it. And you, what's I your take? I enjoyed it, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. But I, there were some things where I was like, okay, they mm -hmm. have to add that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I could tell it's interesting, especially after reading your book. It's like, okay, who was in the writing room for this part? Was yeah. it someone Latinx or was it a yeah. white person? So yeah. it's just interesting watching. Them. Yeah, so that's, a, you know, that's the question. I think those hesitations that you have are valid and those are the hesitations where, you know, we need to enter into whatever story space we're engaged with um, and interrogate and ask. And the reason is that um, what ends up happening is um, well, would you say that that's a fairly, ultimately fairly conservative story? Like, what is the plot of Father of the Bride? So, his daughter, his precious daughter, is getting married. He does not want her mm -hmm. to get married, leave home. So, I would say it's pretty conservative. Pretty conservative. And then how does it end? So, it ends with him finally accepting his new son and everyone happily ever after. Right, okay. So, you know, taking... so. One of the things that I think it's worth us thinking about in our, in our engagement with popular culture is, is it good enough to have a brown or Latino or black actor um, who's basically there in kind of phenotype only, mm -hmm. in skin color only, um, and not even if there's a, a, some kind of backstory or anchor in co the cultural context of that character, when that backstory isn't given any complexity, it, when it becomes itself a stereotype, then are we actually doing a disservice? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's color conscious casting because we're saying, okay, look, we're putting a Latino or a black actor in front of the camera, but is it color conscious writing? Mm. Right? Yeah. And I think we're asking for both. Yeah. That's super, super important to keep in mind for sure. Um, and there was things in the movie that were like, okay, and yeah, it, it was a story written for a white mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading a wasp family, and then they put, you know, a Cuban family and a Mexican family. So, it, yeah, some, mm -hmm. some writing choices definitely, I feel, could have been. And, you know, that's another really important thing for us to keep in mind is that our Latino, Latinx communities are very, very different, you know, varied and different. Mm -hmm. We share, um, there's a lot of commonality we share, um, eventually at some point, we share language as a kind of root. Um, we can say that maybe we share comunidad, you know, f a food, um, a kind of sensibility. But 
there are different political histories to the different ways that we've been treated mm -hmm. um, in this country generationally um, and also treated as immigrants if that's the case so you know as we all know the united states wanted to show really good face during the cold war so you know with cubans touching soil in florida um, there was uh, a kind of open arm there was the kind of peter pan um, moment all of that stuff where if you made it out of cuba we were going to um, accept you and we never really had that with mexico for instance or central america so yeah very different immigration histories and different histories inflect how those communities are in this country today and sometimes we don't see eye to eye you know i have had lots of arguments with cuban latinos in in miami uh, because they don't have the same historical social political experience that me and my communities and families have in the southwest so yeah that's an important thing too so writing writers in that writing room need to be aware of that yeah um so yeah um andy garcia has never really been cast as more than a kind of very light-skinned you know latino usually cuban mm -hmm. um never really kind of involved in the same kinds of politics that you know a story set in texas or california yeah. and a latino family kind of dealing with stuff there yeah for sure yeah. all right so the next question that we have um, is geared towards um, your work with comedy um, comics rather sorry about that mm -hmm. um, and there's a new Marvel movie out starring America Chavez. Mm. And we are really curious. I mm. watched it with my sister, and I know that Kat is a huge Marvel fan. Mm. So we're wondering what your mm. perception of this movie is, how the representation is in the movie. So this is Doctor Strange the and the Multiverse of Madness. Yes. OK, so. Um, yeah um gosh i have a, some stuff to say okay. not, it's not necessarily positive okay but do you are you guys because i don't want to crush anybody no here. no i i'm very sophie open to tell that. me did you what did you think about it um i thought from my perspective that it was good representation mm -hmm. um i thought that she was given, I think in general, if you compare her to like Captain America, for example, like her powers and just baseline, mm -hmm. what she can do as a superhero mm -hmm. are um, very powerful, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that was my major takeaway. Um, but I am curious. I know I am mm -hmm. very, after reading your works, I'm very... Um, critical. Critical, right. yep. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm curious. <laughs> to, yeah, it's good to be both, right? right. So... Um, <laughs> So maybe a kind of uh, eyes wide open, critical optimism, yes, right? right yeah. So yeah, I, I, I love that she's bilingual. Um, and I also love that it's kind of framed, you know, in and around, the whole narrative is framed in and around, um, you know, Doctor Strange and America, um, and really like, you know, saving, saving the multiverse. Um, I love that she can punch through kind of the dimensions, the inner dim the, um, uh, these different worldly multiverse dimensions. And she's sassy. Um, I wanted more. Yeah. You know, and I know this is kind of a setup. This is uh, phase, what, five of the MCU setting it up for that, mm -hmm. um, where in 2024, we're going to start seeing, you know, a lot more like Kamala Khan, yeah. America and others. Miles and so on, getting you know in in the MCU feature length film space, not yes. the little you know uh, six episode stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, um, I yeah, I guess that was it. I just I I wanted more. It's not that I I want less of Doctor Strange and I want more of America Chavez mm -hmm. and and honestly I think that it would have been a better movie if they had done that. Yeah. 
I don't know. What do you think, Catherine? No, I, I totally agree because um, they make us fall in love with her, but we are wanting more at the end. So I would have loved more of her backstory with her moms. Um, so I just, I just, that was totally. the tiniest bit yeah. and then they didn't really talk about it anymore. So yeah. I think I totally agree with your sentiment of less Doctor Strange and more America Chavez for sure. Yeah. And also, um, you know, in the America Chavez comics run, um, there are, you know, there, she's, she's not just like, I felt like there was too much CGI kind of, um, big monster stuff and I, maybe this is a comment about the MCU in general, but I'm more of a kind of like, you know, get your fists out and like, you know, throw some punches and, mm -hmm. and do the job on the kind of street level. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and America's all about that. So yeah, I, I wanted more, I wanted more of that, and hopefully we'll get that. Kamala Khan, can we just talk about that a second? Yes, loved the show. <laughs> Love Kamala Khan. Like... I don't know, Sophie, if you got a chance to see it. No, I did you not. Have to. No. It's amazing. Yeah. Disney Plus. <laughs> like, like, that one just knocks it out yeah. of the ballpark, yep. you know, on every level. And that's color conscious casting, mm -hmm. color conscious writing, yes. you know, and they took a big risk um, setting her backstory so, um, anchoring it so solidly in a pre and post partition India um, and the politics of that. Um, coming from a, the Muslim side, mm -hmm. you know, of, of the kind of terror, the horror, the violence of British rule and the imposing of a border, not just a border, but forcing Muslims and Hindus to live with, when they were living as neighbors. Um, and it shows that, you yeah. know, um, friends and family suddenly having to be separated. Um, and forced onto trains either direction in their mass in this massive relocation that happened right yeah. as a result of the 47 yeah. so and then of course as a kind of you know Desi or um, South Asian American um, you know growing up in Jersey City and all of that and the kinds of fun and tensions and you know everything about it the street life the home life the the battles are coming into her superpowers I I thought that hit it like perfectly yeah and her being a child of immigrants and they showed that dynamic so well of these are two parents who are strict and mm -hmm. they they don't want her just doing anything. So trying to get to the convention, that was such yeah. a struggle. And I yeah. think so many people can relate to that. Like yeah. their parents don't get it. They don't yeah. understand their, uh, my, my love for obsession for mm -hmm. this thing. So I loved how they portrayed that. And also, you know, the other side of it is that the, the parents go on their journey and they finally come to um, see and love their daughter for who she is. Mm -hmm. And you know, a really important part of it is not only the connection between the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter, um, but also between the father. Yes. And the tenderness that is seen, you know, it's very, very rare for us to see um, brown, black fathers and their children in having a, a tender yes. relationship. They're either absent or they're um, violent. Um, you know, or imposing or patriarchal and so on. And it was, it was lovely to see that in yes. Kamala yeah. uh, and Miss Marvel. Yeah. So we I think they, yes, yes. Yeah. it was fantastic. Everybody needs to watch <laughs> it. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's two steps forward right now, maybe one step back. Sometimes I feel like that step back can be a little bit slippery, you yeah. know, um, and like snakes and ladders so mm -hmm. but i'm excited and i know that you both will be important and are continue to to kind of work to make sure that we're you know people are getting getting it right you know because um our voices need to be heard yes for sure so for our final wrap up question i'm gonna have you be a little creative so if you had unlimited funding and resources what is a dream project that you would create um, yeah, wow. Okay, so, <laughs> um, okay, so I just, on October 12th, I am launching the Latinx Pop Lab at UT Austin, and, um, 
that has, you know, it's a space for teachers, K through 12 teachers to come and learn how to kind of take comics back into their spaces. But it's also a space of learning with like, you know, students like yourselves coming together, seminars, workshops, um, zooming in specialists from around the country. We have, uh, we'll have a 3D printer, we'll have a, a, um, a, a copier and printer for comics that we can make like on the spot. Um, we'll have a happy hour podcast stuff going on. But if I had unlimited resources, it would become like, you know, my, the person just down the road, Robert Rodriguez, he's got Troublemaker Studios, he's the film director, and he has this old airport that he bought, turned all of the airport hang hangers into green screens. Mm. And, you know, he makes incredibly cool movies, right? Planetaire, Alita, right? Um, Desperado, um, yeah. you know, all of those fun things, Spy Kids. Um, so I would, if I had unlimited resources, I would Latinx Pop Lab, like, hang, you know, Robert Rodriguez style and just go nuts. And, you know, we would not just be thinking about, like, comic books. We would be thinking about comic book movies and, yeah. you know, all of that. And everybody in that space would be... Um, you know, it would be like color conscious everything, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that would be my dream. Mm. Great, great answer. That was super awesome. Um, so thank you, Dr. Aldama, so much for joining us here for the interview. Um, thank you all for watching.